Before I explain a lot about taxonomy and what can go wrong and how you should, in theory, uh, fix it or deal with it, what I'll do in the next part is actually um, show you uh, some tools that can help you in uh, the quality control of all those biodiversity data. Um, I like these. This is sometimes how I feel when I'm doing data management. Um, you really want to throw that computer somewhere because nothing seems to be right. Everything seems to be wrong. But in the end, um, if you actually go through the whole process of uh, managing a data set, taking your time to um, look up everything, make sure that everything is correct, um, I get a really happy face. So what needs to be checked? Um, I have a very simple answer for that, everything. If you receive a data set, you actually need to check everything from the metadata to the data, to the dots, to the commas, uh, everything. Um, I'll first give you some background. Um, OBIS has a number of quality control procedures in place. A number of them are um, automated on the OBIS database. Um, a number of those um, are available through tools and web services so that you can do a first check yourself before you uh, submit data. The aim of these quality control procedures is to really help uh, you as a data provider and a manager to check the quality and the completeness of the data sets that you're dealing with and also to detect possible errors um, in the data. Uh, quality flags, if they are assigned on the OBIS database, are assigned to each available record. And although we call them quality flags, um, we don't really want to use them to say this record is good or bad. We want to use them to evaluate the fitness for purpose of a specific record so that it helps users later on to filter out records with a certain uh, quality standard or a certain content. I'm just going to show you an example to illustrate that. So we have a record, um, a distribution record of um, a mollusk at a specific latitude and longitude in a specific year. We can use this record for a general distribution analysis because it's a species occurrence record. It can also be used for a general temporal analysis because it has a year, so it can be used in uh, evaluating yearly trends, for example. It cannot be used for seasonal analysis because we don't have any more information than just the year. And it can also not be used for abundance-related analysis because it's a presence-only record. Not, it's not because it's a presence-only that it cannot be used for any of the other things. So that's what we mean by we're not um, tagging a record as being good or bad. We're just giving an indication of uh, the fitness. Um, so the approach I mentioned earlier, we have an automated process within the database and we have a number of online web services. And it's the online web services that I will uh, um, show you and how you can use them uh, later this week. Okay. Um, for those who are interested in the technical uh, story behind the quality control, there's eight QC control steps on an individual record level, and there's 10 additional outlier checks, uh, which are either on database or on species level. Each quality control step uh, here is a yes or no question. So it's either yes, um, it does that, or no, it doesn't do that. What we do with all these yes and no's, or these zeros and ones, is we create a bit sequence. So we can store the, the full uh, evaluation of the record as an integer value in the database. And each possible combination of those 20 uh, 28 checks is a unique value. So based on that unique value, we can pull it apart again and check uh, which um, steps it complies or not or doesn't comply to okay um, i already mentioned this in the earlier presentation what i have asked you last week or two weeks ago is to already register on the lifewatch uh, website i've seen lots of emails pass so i'm guessing everybody did register so thank you for that if you go to the lifewatch website which is uh, www.lifewatch.be um, at the right upper corner, you have the login button. If you go there, you just give your email address and um, the password, and then you're in the system. Um, if someone would not have registered yet, you can just, um, at the bottom of that page, you have the register button. You, you can still do that. That's not a problem. 
Um, why the need to register? Not for us to keep track of everything that you do, but for yourself to keep track of everything that you do. Because the system works through jobs that you submit. So you submit specific files um, with which you want to do something, a specific quality control. Afterwards, you can always go back uh, to your uh, own page within the LifeWatch website, and you can go back to all the jobs that you have done and their results. Okay. So once you've logged in, uh, you'll na your name should be there uh, on top. And um, you basically start with a new job there. And I'll explain that um, in a minute and how you go through everything. So uh, the previous presentation or the previous talk was largely focused on taxonomic quality control. And that's what I'll start with here, the specific tools that you can use for the quality checks. There's two different ways of doing that. Either you can go through Worms. Uh, the Worms website has that taxon much uh, option. I'm not sure if has any of you already used that in the past, the taxon much of Worms. Yes, OK. Um, LifeWatch offers a similar thing. But then you're not just matching with Worms. You're, uh, you have the option to match with a lot of other taxonomic databases. And a few of them are listed there. Um, why do we offer this? If a species would be a non-marine species, of course, you won't get a match in worms. But if it does match with any of the other systems, it already gives you a really good indication on what you're dealing with, whether it's terrestrial or freshwater, whether it occurs in another system or not. Um, what we standardly say is that if you uh, put a species through the LifeWatch taxon match, and you get no results on any of the taxonomic registers that we're offering, you definitely need to go back to your provider because something is wrong with the name. Uh, whereas on the other hand, if it would, for example, appear in the catalog of life and in uh, index fungorum, then you know that you're dealing with an actual species name, which is just missing from worms. And then you can take a different approach. OK. So step by step, what we do, um, it's a bit the same as what I showed earlier. So you match uh, your name with worms. If it matches, you document the LSID or the AFIA ID. You check the habitat to make sure that it's marine. And you check the taxonomic level, or am I dealing with a genus or a species uh, as background information. If it doesn't match with worms, you match with all those other registers. If it does match there, one or more systems, you can find it. Then you check whether it's marine or not. Or another system that you can use for that is Erming, uh, Interim Register of Marine and Non-Marine Genera. It's a very, very complete register of all genera ever described. It's 95% complete. Um, it used to be managed and hosted by Tony Rees at CSIRO. Uh, since mm, a little bit over a year, it's hosted here at Vlis. So we are also maintaining that register. So if you find in Erming that it is marine, um, you can contact us and we will contact the taxonomic uh, editor because that is definitely then a name that is missing from worms. If it's not marine, uh, what we do within OBIS is we add it to an annotated list saying, OK, this is not marine, it's freshwater, it's terrestrial, whatever. And that's why it's not in worms. That's why we cannot match. If it doesn't match with any of, the other, any of the other registers I just explained, you go back to your provider for a secondary check. If you get an update from him, if you get a new name, you just run the whole uh, taxonomic QC again. So first on worms, um, for the people who don't know uh, this, there's a much taxa menu item right there. Uh, Difference between Worms and LifeWatch, on Worms it's freely available. You don't need a password, you don't need to log in, you can just go there, upload your Excel file or text file, and run it through the taxon much. So what it does is, I think I have, okay, just show by an example. So you prepare your own file. Um, so on the left, that's my own file, those are my species names. And uh, what you do is you just upload it to this uh, taxon much tool. You have to define some column headers, uh, which are pretty easy to, uh, to deal with. There's a number of options that you can select as output, uh, depending on how much information you want. And then the system will match it for you. So what you have then online is on the left, 
your own uh, species list that you uploaded, and on the right, the AFIA match. The green ones are exact matches. There's no need to look at them in more detail. The system has done its work. If it's red, it can say none, which means that it hasn't found any match within worms. And the third option that you have is it's an ambiguous match. And then it says select below. It gives you two or three or four options of what it could be. Um, just in a little bit more detail. Um, so Solea Solea is an exact match on species level. What I mentioned earlier is that if you match with an unidentified species, so the SPUR1 or SPUR, is the system already recognizes this. So what it does is it matches with the genus. The third one says larvae, so indicates the, the life stage, has nothing to do with the scientific name. System recognizes that and matches with the genus. Um, for this one, the nonsense doesn't recognize it at all, so it says no match. The ambiguous one is more, uh, a little bit more difficult to, uh, to solve. That goes back to the homonyms, like if you have the different authorities for the same name, how do you have to deal with it? So if your provider would have given you the authority, then it's a very easy choice to make. If not, then it takes a little bit more of detective work to figure it out. Okay. Um, you can choose how you download uh, the Excel sheets. Uh, what I do have to say here is that this is online, so if you want, you can sort everything out online. The danger is that if it takes you too long to sort it out online, the system gives you a timeout and you lose the work that you've already done. So what we mostly recommend is just download the results. The only difference is that if it's an ambiguous match in the Excel file, it will only say ambiguous and you will have to look it up again in Worms to see the different options. But it gives you a little bit more time to figure everything out uh, instead of having to stress online to stay within the, the limited time that you have there. Okay, so this is what an Excel file looks like. Again, you get your original name, you get the AFIA ID, you get the match type, um, so whether it was an exact match. <laughs> what you can also have is a phonetic match. Typically there is that PF and uh, PH, sorry, and F are phonetic matches. Um, it can show up. It can still be a correct match, but it does uh, tell you that it wasn't exact. And then the near one, near twos, I'll explain a bit later, has to do with the number of letters that differ from what you have and what Worms has. Um, there we go. No match is, of course, also possible. Um, what we recommend here is that you check and verify everything that is not an exact match. So even if it says phonetic match, just have an extra look at it and make sure that you're talking about the same thing, the same for the near one and the near two matches. So phonetic, um, some examples might be double L and one L. Every double letter and single letter um, is a phonetic match. Near one matches uh, happen often with the um and the us ending of words. Near two matches, uh, an example here is two letters differ. So you have Finn Marcius, uh, double N and IU, while it should be N and C. So little spelling variations that can happen. Near two, uh, also related to the male or the female ending of the species epithet. That can also happen. So it should be A or the other way around. Those are the things that you can expect with uh, phonetic and near matches. Uh, be very careful with the near ma two matches because they can, in some cases, be something totally different. So that's why you really need to double check. Okay, then on LifeWatch. So um, if you log in on LifeWatch, the exact the exact same file that you uploaded through the Worms taxon match can go through the LifeWatch taxon match. And if you upload it here, so you just browse for it. Um, there's a section here. Taxon Match Services. And if we open that, you get an overview of all the taxonomic registers that we are currently linking with through web services. Um, you can select all of them or you can be selective in your selection, uh, by which I mean the more registers you select to do your match, the longer it will take to do your match. So if you know that uh, your file does not contain any fossil data, 
then don't select the paleontological database because you'll do a match for nothing and it will just take up extra time. If you're not sure, of course, go ahead and do it. But if you already know, I'm only working with um, current, currently existing species. And for example, uh, none of them are fungi, then you can leave out already two options. Okay. So once you select them, um, at the bottom of the page, it will list again what you have selected. And if you want, you can change the order of things. Uh, if worms would be first and you don't want the worms results first, but last, you can just shift um, and everything. And again, uh, whatever matching you do, if you match with worms and you cannot find it in worms, and it is available in any of the other registers, just let us know. So again, I'll brainwash you. It's info at marinespecies.org. Never forget that address. So once the matching is done, um, you can get um, a preview of uh, what you have uploaded. So I have uploaded a number of scientific names, in this case already with a specific latitude and longitude. And I will uh, run that list through all these uh, services. Then you get a result. What happens in your Excel is that your basic Excel or text file that you uploaded a number of columns get added that contain all the necessary information to let you know whether there was a match or not. So this is basically all the added fields in this case that you get. And again, you can use this report as a feedback, both to your provider and to uh, worms. So what's it going to say, for example, um, just looking if yeah, if yeah, if yeah. So taxon match, match count, aphia, it says the number of matches in that specific column, it will say, and it explains if it says zero, there's no match. If it's one, there's an exact match. If it's more than one, then there's more than one match. So that's the homonyms actually that it shows here. It's a little bit different than what it shows on worms, but it gives you an indication of how many matches there are. Okay. Um, so for the ambiguous uh, matches, it's a bit the same as what I explained earlier. Um, be careful with those. If you're not sure, then don't match them. That's basically the rule that we uh, give to everyone. That's also the rule that we apply here at FLIS for the European data sets. If we're not sure, don't do anything. Consult with whoever provided you with the data sets. Um, I showed this already. Okay, so that was taxonomy. Um, that will take up a big part of, of the actual quality control that you need to do. What else are we offering through uh, services is a geographic quality control. LifeWatch um, gives you several options and the first one is the most convenient one, is just show on map. You just upload the coordinates that you received and the system just puts them on the map. And right away visually you can see whether uh, the locations are marine or not. And the second one is related to marine regions. There's a number of services uh, related to that. Um, I would say to m tomorrow, if you actually start with the hands-on, just have a look at those services and see if they can be of any use uh, for you. So the concept of the geographical quality control it's very simple. We're checking if the latitude and longitude are correct, are valid. Um, Peter already explained that we need coordinates in WGS 84 decimal degrees. That's what uh, the database deals with. And then uh, we check the correctness by plotting and comparing with the metadata. If everything is correct, we don't have to worry about anything. What are the most common mistakes uh, with coordinates? Is latitude and longitude get switched? Uh, somehow in digitizing or documenting everything, latitude ends up in the longitude column and the other way around. Um, very easy to spot on a map. So if you actually plot the coordinates, you'll see that right away that there's a consistent error uh, in, the, in the data. Uh, what can also happen is that since we're WGS 84 decimal degrees, south and west are indicated with the minus sign very common mistake is that people forget the minus sign. So what should be in the southern hemisphere is all of a sudden in the northern hemisphere. 
if you have the metadata, if you have the background and you see that on a map, it's very easy to just uh, to see what, what went wrong. Um, so what we also get um, from historical data sets is just um, all kinds of different annotations for coordinates. Peter already showed some examples of that. So what we need to do in those cases is really recalculate uh, the coordinates until the decimal degrees. Okay. Um, coordinates are really indispensable in the case of OBIS because they are the basis for a biogeographic information system. Now, in some cases, coordinates will be missing. Several things that you can do. First of all, of course, is that you'll check with your provider or the source. Do you have the coordinates? Um, in most cases, they will. They just forgot to provide them. They thought that saying Mediterranean or North Sea was enough. So when they exist, you just complete the file, run the quality control. When they are not uh, existing, there's two things that you can do. Um, if there's publications on the data set, then mostly they will contain a map indicating the stations that were sampled. Um, anybody who has a little bit of experience with GIS can upload that map in GIS, uh, plot uh, the WGS84 on top of it, and just uh, pick the corresponding coordinates and add those to the system. Uh, so that was the case, what we've done here. We knew that the stations were there, so we just kind of plotted the whole thing and made sure that we derived uh, the correct coordinates. The second thing you can do is check marine regions to assign coordinates. Uh, Peter also already mentioned that. Um, marine regions, um, you can basically compare marine regions to worms, but then for place names. It has hierarchy, it has different names pointing to the same thing and so on. Um, if you want to know more about marine regions, I would just refer to the website, have a look. It has a very good uh, introduction page. There's also a paper on the data system, so it might be valuable background information for you. Um, what we found then most, most times is people provide a data set and they say species A is present in Kenya. If we would map this with marine regions, um, if you talk about Kenya, then you would actually uh, link it to the the country, the region. But then again, we know we're talking about marine species, so why would we link a marine species to land? A lot more sense is, or it would make a lot more sense if we just link it with the adjacent sea area, which in this case could be the Kenyan exclusive economic zone. So from this information that you get from your provider, through marine regions, you can actually come to that sea area that is linked to it, and you get the actual latitude and longitude plus the precision. Remember that Peter mentioned earlier that you can document the precision in the database so that people get an idea of how, precise, uh, how precisely the observation was made. So indicate the precision. So that's a way of using marine regions to get to a good coordinate and a precision to um, make your data more complete. Can I ask you another annoying question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Um, if it's intertidal, yes. is it land or sea? And in fact, we, in Australia, we have a very specific usage for EZ. It's only waters outside of five nautical miles. Or whatever yeah, it is. I'm giving so the... the shore stuff is actually treated as... as yeah. I'm just giving this as an example. EEZ's marine regions is very broad in the marine regions that it offers. It's not only EEZ, it's also IHOs, it's other sea basins, it has the ISIS uh, fishing areas and so on. There's lots of information in there. So if you're looking for something uh, specific, do a thorough search on marine regions. Marine regions also works with intersects between IHO and EEZ areas. That's also something that they're offering. And if I'm not mistaken, they are going to do something about the coastal regions. So the five nautical miles or the three, is it three or five? I always forget. Yeah. That, that, that first actual coastal waters. Yeah. I think there's at least plans or they're already working on it to, to get those regions in there too. So that, uh, that could help. So within the web services itself, if you're on the LifeWatch web service page, um, 
Show on map is under data validation and QC services. So you just tick that box and then you run it. And the other marine region gazetteer services I was mentioning are under a separate section where you can either choose one or choose different ones um, to run your data against. Okay. So this is what it looks like if you plot your uh, coordinates on a map. It gives you a very nice overview. So if someone tells me that they have data for the Belgian part of the North Sea and that everything is really taken within the Belgian EEZ and I plot the coordinates and I see this, then I know there's a little issue uh, with that so that certain points need to be looked at in detail. Okay. Some examples, um, again, live examples, data sets that we received in the future. And um, by looking at those, you see again the importance of the metadata or good titles. titles sorry. So this data set is called Monitoring in the Kongsfjorden area, which is there, which looks pretty good. And then all of a sudden, I got this little point all of the way where it doesn't belong. What happened here? Very simple, latitude and longitude for that specific record got switched by accident. It's a very, like if you plot this and you visually see this, it's very easy to catch. It's very easy to correct. Um, another one, monitoring in the Belgian part of the North Sea. So I'm expecting my dots to be only there. What I'm seeing is a lot of dots there. What happened is that the plus and the minus signs got switched. Again, very easy if you plot this visually. Um, of course, these visual checks only work if you have geographically defined uh, or bounded data sets. If you're looking at a global data set, then you'll have no idea whether that one specific dot is right or wrong. But if you know that data have been collected within a specific area, then this uh, check can really help you to verify the information that you got. Um, last example, sightings and strandings of marine turtles around the coast of the UK and Ireland, which looks really good here, but has some very strange things there. Um, what happened, and this is also, a, again, a common error, is that the minus sign was missing, because people forget that that Meridian is there, that they have to have that minus sign. So again, very easily spotted if you plot it, very easily correct it. So taxonomy, geography, that'll be your biggest job, basically, and the quality control and, and investing time to, to checking that. And then there's a whole range of other things that can be checked. Um, and people sometimes ask, what else do I need to check? And our answer is basically use your common sense, just look what the data is about, and then think for yourself what is useful for me to double check. Um, one thing that I can still, or we can still offer through LifeWatch is a data format validation uh, service. And this service does three things. It will check if your latitude and longitude fields are completed. So if you would have a large data set, you can just uh, check for that. It also checks whether the latitude and longitude are within the possible boundaries. So meaning within the 90 and the 180 uh, boundaries for latitude and longitude. It does not check whether it's in the correct region. So for that, you would need that visual uh, check, but you can combine all these things. And for the dates, uh, as Peter explained, that they need to be in the ISO standard. Um, this data format validation tool also checks whether the dates are in the correct format. So that gives you a quick uh, first look or first view on the, the completeness and the quality of your data set. Um, Peter already showed some examples on the dates. Um, I got some more. <laughs> the, what can go wrong is the year. Um, 1972 is how it's supposed to be. Uh, sometimes you'll find data sets that only say 72. Or people will talk, the data were collected in the 70s. Is it the 1870s or the 1970s? If you don't have any background information, you don't know. So it's important that you have complete years. Make sure that your month is always between 1 and 12. This may sound very easy or very common, but mistakes do happen against that. 
And then also for the day, uh, has to be between 1 and 31, of course, and you have to take into account the month. Uh, we have received data sets that all of a sudden have February 30th. So might be uh, something that you have to keep in mind to check. Uh, what can also happen is that when people start typing, all of a sudden the numbers switch. So they talk about the data set from the 1990s, and then if you check, all of a sudden there's going to be a record from 1909. That's just a typing error that can also, again, very easily be fixed, but something that you can uh, check. If that date is in the ISO format, it will not say it's wrong in that data format validation check. It's up to you to just quickly go through, filter. Um, there's, there's lots of filter options that you can use in Excel to easily check things like this. Um, units is also something that's rather important, of course, because OBIS can capture counts, biomass, it can have depth information and so on. So the units need to be defined. Um, it's nice to know that you found four crabs at a certain location, but from an ecological or biodiversity point of view, it's a big difference if you found those four in one square meter or in 10 square kilometers. So that's something that needs to be there. Also for biomass, uh, we get biomass information, uh, biomass saying nine. But is it wet weight? Is it dry weight? Is it ash-free dry weight? All those things matter if people want to reuse uh, the data. We already had data sets that had depth uh, documented in centimeters. So it's also, if you see really, really big numbers for your depth, it's worthwhile checking whether they used meters or centimeters. All data sets will be in FADEMS which means that you need to recalculate the FAVIMS to meters just to be sure that OBIS um, can, can deal with it. Or not OBIS, but that the users can make good use of the data. Okay, so that was the, uh, the example um, of the crabs or the lobsters or whatever. So it's important to have your, um, your units or your sample size uh, documented. Um, sig the significance of all that, I think, is, is rather obvious, is that you have to know what you're dealing with. Not only you, when you process the data and when you hand it to OBIS, but the user also needs to know what he's dealing with. Um, and um, where you can convert or use the OBIS standards. Um, Peter mentioned the IDs and Wart also picked up on it. Um, if we link to specific um, <coughs> vocabularies, make sure that you know um, everything is done correctly, that you know what you're dealing with. Um, there's also a lot of automated uh, quality control procedures. Um, I already explained the technical parts. Now, some of the automated quality steps are not yet available through web services. So all the web services I explained, um, all those different steps are also done automatically on the OBIS level, but a lot more is done on the OBIS level. And we're still working on making all those other steps also available um, as web services. Um, what happens um, extra on OBIS is you can do this, so the lat long uh, different from zero and between the boundaries is included in the service. Additional in OBIS is it checks um, whether the latitude and longitude are actually within a sea area. And here, important to know is that a 20 kilometer buffer is taken into account for beach surveys, for example, or for tidal region surveys that might be not in the sea, but close enough. Um, OBIS also checks whether if a depth value is given, whether it's a possible one or not. So it uh, plots the corresponding latitude and longitude on the JEPCO map. Then it compares JEPCO with the actual sampling depth. And it does take into account a 100 meter margin. We saw that in our checks ourselves that that's really necessary. But it gives a good indication of whether the given depth within uh, the data set is uh, a possible one. So what we got, uh, two actual um, examples. So for the first one, uh, Desmos Colex genus. The given depth, so the sampling depth that we got was uh, two kilometers. While if we look at JEPCO, the depth in that area is only 500 meters. So something might have gone wrong there in the documentation of the depth that needs to be looked at. Uh, for the second one, 
Um, depth is 110 meters, sampling depth or uh, data collection depth. JEPCO gives more than a kilometer, so the difference is rather big. However, if this is a pelagic species, then that's perfectly uh, okay. A pelagic species, you're not going to um, capture that at uh, the bottom. On the other hand, if you looked a little bit further, this isn't a pelagic species, but it's a bottom dwelling species. So also here, we can figure that something might be wrong. Maybe they just missed a zero, for example. Something that needs to be looked into, but that's done on OBIS level. So these two records are going to be tagged as something is possibly wrong with depth. Um, then there's also a number of outlier analysis, uh, which are again only performed on the OBIS uh, database. And it looks at geographic outliers. Um, so the analysis is done on the data set level. The whole data set is taken into account. All the locations or all the stations are plotted. And then um, we check whether one or more points can be seen as outliers. And then uh, providers are contacted with the result. It's not because something is um, identified as a possible outlier that it actually is an outlier. So just to give you an example, uh, we had a data set from ISIS, ISIS Biological Community. So if we plot everything, this is what we get. Uh, the system identifies the centroid and then identifies the, non the no outliers, the gray ones around here. And then it identifies the possible outliers, which are all the dark uh, dots. Now, if you look at this, you can already know that, OK, this is wrong. We're talking about a marine data set and we have points on land. So we need to look into that um, in more detail. Um, on the other hand, those two groups are also identified as possible outliers. Are they or are they not? So what we've done is uh, we checked with the provider and we learned that the Antarctic locations are actually incorrect. They should be in the northern hemisphere, so there's a mistake in the latitude longitude. While uh, these ones here, the northern locations, are correct sampling locations. There's just a bias in the sampling that makes that the system doesn't necessarily see them as being correct. So although the, um, all the quality control procedures on OBIS can help us in identifying possible mistakes, we cannot yet take them for granted. Um, if a record has a flag as possible outlier, it's still up to the user to check whether it's an actual outlier or, and he wants to uh, exclude them from the analysis, or if it could be correct and he wants to take them into account. Uh, a second thing, so that was, that was actually outliers on, on stations, on locations. A second thing that is done is outliers at the species level. So what happens here is that um, for a specific species, all the records within OBIS are brought together and are plotted on a map. And based on that, the system again looks if there's possible outliers in the available distribution records or not. Um, it checks on different levels. It checks on geography, on depth, on um, salinity and temperature. It takes all that into account. And then again, you see that there's a, this is OK for the geography, for example. This is OK for depth. And then there's a difference between the geography check and the depth check. Now, if we look at this in more detail, because that could be a dubious result. Here it's not OK. There it is OK. What is it now? So if we check further, if we uh, verify additionally, uh, with worms, with the available literature, with expert-based uh, distribution information. What happened is that, um, no, it doesn't say, this is actually okay. These are not outliers. It's just, again, the fact that there's no information from here available, which makes that the system might think that these are outliers. Well, they're not. On the other hand, those really are outliers. Those are um, uh, wrongly identified species. So. All these checks help us to get an idea of the fitness for purpose of the quality of all these, uh, all these records. Um, the QC steps are run on OBIS, 
but it's not yet possible through the portal to uh, get to those QC flags. That's something that OBIS is working on and that will be available in the future. But uh, on the other hand, if you would like that information, I guess we can just ask OBIS to retrieve uh, the quality flags from the system and get you that information. And that's it. So it's been a lot of information, I know. Um, a lot of things will become a lot more clear tomorrow when you actually start working with your own data sets. Specific questions will arise. Uh, we're here to help you two days in a row, uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Not just me, but also other people of the data management team. I know Sophie is in the back. Uh, she'll help with the taxonomic quality control. There's Daphnis who can really help with uh, getting your data in the correct format uh, for uh, the IPT to upload them. Uh, he also knows a bit about the quality control procedures. And Wim disappeared, I think. <laughs> Wim was here earlier. He's also going to help out with uh, taxonomic QC. So there's uh, part of the team here. Make use of us in the sense that if you have questions tomorrow, just ask them. We'll help you the best we can. The more you ask us, the more easy it will become to deal with those data sets. And when you get back home then and you have to redo it on other data sets, it will become a lot easier. Thank you.